What's up guys welcome back this is anime crossover, you'll be watching what if Naruto was married to the goddess of death in Marvel part 14, now, let's begin. Eternity, one of the five deities that governed the universe for innumerable years, possessed undeniable strength. The current Naruto was experiencing significant pressure while confronting Eternity's clone. This was also connected to Naruto's limited integration with the Silver Superman body template. If Naruto were to fully integrate with the Silver Superman body template, he would not regard the five gods as a significant challenge, even in their combined form. Consequently, Naruto remained completely unconcerned about the possibility of being targeted by the five gods. Due to the previous embarrassment caused by Eternity's clone, Naruto was determined not to overlook this issue. In any situation, he must seek retribution. In the following moment, two intense beams of heat vision erupted from Naruto's eyes, targeting Eternity's clone. Simultaneously, numerous dimensions were reshaped into a confinement that ensnared the clone of Eternity. Eternity's clone was unable to evade, and Naruto's intense heat vision struck him directly. Eternity's clone possessed the capability to navigate these numerous dimensions, as that was his area of expertise. Naruto did not allow him an opportunity. By the time he breached the dimensional cage, the attack had already commenced. The possibility of Eternity's clone escaping the trap was entirely eliminated. Following the assault from Naruto's intense heat vision, capable of melting anything, the body of Eternity's clone fell apart. Not even the five great deities could prevent Naruto's ultimate technique. Certainly, this was also connected to the fact that Naruto Bai was merely confronting a clone. If it were the true Eternity himself, it would be highly unlikely for Naruto to overcome his opponent with such ease. However, if Naruto's accomplishment of defeating Eternity's clone were to become known, it would undoubtedly astonish numerous powerhouses across the universe. While it was merely a clone, it was a clone of Eternity. Eternity's clone possesses the capability to eliminate a dimensional lord such as Dormammu with a single strike. The quality of existence was markedly different. The existence of the five gods above the universe for countless years is a reasonable consideration. It has concluded. Observing Eternity's clone, whose form was perpetually disintegrating, Naruto remarked with a chill in his voice. By taking this action, he effectively positioned himself as an adversary to the five gods. However, Naruto did not feel regret, as it was inevitable that it would occur at some point. Naruto's role as a traverser indicated that he and the five gods were unable to coexist harmoniously. The celestial group consistently demonstrated their aggression towards Naruto. The five esteemed deities positioned themselves behind the celestial group. It is hard to fathom that the celestial group would engage in an attack on Naruto without the directives from the five gods. Furthermore, Naruto was not known for his generosity. The Celestial Group has conducted two attacks against him. Naruto found it unacceptable to simply allow them to escape. While Naruto did not experience defeat in these two battles, a sense of enmity was established. If an opportunity arises in the future, Naruto would be open to engaging with the Celestial Group and the Five Gods to address this matter appropriately. We will reconvene. Despite the sensation of his body perpetually deteriorating, Eternity's clone maintained a completely expressionless visage. He regarded Naruto with a cold demeanor and stated. Similar to Naruto's tendency to harbor resentment, Eternity would undoubtedly exhibit the same inclination. Furthermore, Eternity's intent to eliminate Naruto was undoubtedly more intense than Naruto's animosity towards the five great gods. Eternity has governed the universe for innumerable years. Did he not desire a face? Naruto eliminated his clone. If he did not impose a significant punishment on Naruto, he would find it difficult to maintain his standing within the universe. Simultaneously, the five gods resembled the seasoned forces within the universe, and understandably, they would be reluctant to witness the rise of a formidable entity such as Naruto. If individuals like Naruto matured, they would challenge their established norms. Given this fact, the five gods were unable to permit Naruto's departure. It is anticipated that there will be increasingly significant conflicts between the five gods and Naruto in the future. Nonetheless, Naruto remained indifferent. Naruto disregarded Eternity's warning. 
the comment made prior to departure was nothing short of unkind. If he aimed to intimidate Naruto with this alone, it was merely an unrealistic aspiration. Following the resolution of eternity, Naruto departed from this location. He was well aware that Thanos awaited him on Earth. The conflict on Earth persisted tragically. Thanos was visibly struggling under heelous assaults, and his demise seemed imminent. He was dependent on Power Stone for his survival, yet his circumstances remained tenuous. Hela had also utilized her Infinity Stones. For Infinity Stones were visible, gleaming in Hela's hands. Space, time, reality, and mind. The combination of these for forces significantly enhanced Hela's combat effectiveness to an extraordinary degree. The sole reason Thanos has managed to survive until this point, without being eliminated by Hela in mere seconds, can be attributed to sheer luck. In the presence of absolute strength, luck holds no significance. Thanos would only be capable of postponing his demise at most. At this point, Thanos had reached a state of exhaustion. Following the piercing of his legs by Hela's sword, he subsequently lost his mobility. He could only observe with a sense of powerlessness as Hela, wielding the sword, approached him deliberately. The outcome appears to have been determined, and the conclusion is approaching. Hela held for infinite gems in her left hand and the sword in her right hand, addressing Thanos with an air of indifference. In the presence of others, Hela exhibited an aloof and commanding demeanor. Imposing and valiant. Her every move and even a glance conveyed a significant sense of authority. The Hela before Naruto and the other Hela represented two entirely different entities. Just as Hela was poised to end Thanos' life, a sudden, sharp sound pierced the air from her side. A metal spear, shining with a cold light, was swiftly approaching Hela from afar. Hela effortlessly evaded the sneak attack with a subtle movement, rendering any injury impossible. At that moment, Hela observed the assailant. Ebony Moore, adorned with bloodstains on his attire and at the corner of his mouth, was suspended in the air, gradually advancing toward Hela. If you intend to harm my master, you will first need to overcome my unwavering defense. Ebony Moore, suspended in mid-air, addressed Hala. He positioned himself before Thanos and focused his gaze on Hala. It is evident that Ebony Moore was an exemplary subordinate. Dedicated, skilled, and committed to fully supporting Thanos. Your loyalty and dedication are truly valued, and I hold great appreciation for individuals of your caliber. In response, I will ensure your demise is executed with the utmost dignity, and I will proceed past your remains. While she held a sense of appreciation for him, Hala was resolute in her decision to retain Ebony Moore. The two parties were adversaries, and this situation was unalterable. Nonetheless, Ebony Moore's expression did not alter. He maintained his position in front of Thanos, observing as Hala approached with deliberate steps. I apologize for my role in hindering your progress. Thanos addressed Ebony Moore. This overlord, having existed in the universe for an extensive period, disclosed his more gentle nature for the first time. Simultaneously, the leading forces advanced towards Hala with great momentum. General Deathblade, one of the five Obsidian generals, also brought Midnight Proxima to provide support. While it appeared that Thanos was at a disadvantage against Hala, his vanguard troops possessed exceptional combat capabilities. The vanguard forces had entirely eradicated the human armies. At this juncture, only superheroes remained, endeavoring to provide mutual support during this challenging period. Hulk and Captain Marvel were the only members of the superhero group who still possessed a notable level of combat capability. The presence of these two individuals was instrumental in saving the lives of other superheroes. The superheroes, including Spider-Man, Captain America, Winter Soldier, and the Fantastic Four, appeared visibly fatigued, their expressions reflecting a sense of exhaustion. Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Black Widow had succumbed to a coma, receiving protection from fellow superheroes. It can be asserted that humanity faced a total defeat in this conflict. The human forces deployed to confront the Thanos army faced near total annihilation. The remaining superheroes, safeguarded by Hulk and Captain Marvel, were struggling to maintain their resistance. The primary reason for the support of the five Obsidian Generals for Thanos was this. 
Nonetheless, even during a significant siege, Hela maintained her composure. She advanced steadily among the thousands of troops, yet the vanguard soldiers and the five obsidian generals surrounding her remained motionless, not daring to take a step forward. Ebony Moore was under significant pressure as he confronted Hela. He clenched his jaw, employed his telekinesis to manipulate numerous stones and steel, and advanced towards Hela. He anticipated that this could halt Hela's advance. However, with a sudden burst of dark red light emanating from the reality stone in Hela's possession, all of these stones and steel transformed into bubbles. The reality stone altered the fabric of reality. With a swift motion of her wrist, she propelled the sword from her hand. At a remarkable velocity, it transformed into a black light and penetrated the body of Ebony Moore. Hela swiftly eliminated this highly competent and devoted subordinate of Thanos in mere seconds. Even Thanos appeared subordinate in the presence of Hela. How could Ebony more possibly stand as an opponent to Hela? Simultaneously, in response to Hela's movements, the nearby vanguard troops advanced towards her. Like a continuous flow, wave after wave, they advanced toward Hela. If the strength of the individual entity is insufficient, then leverage the collective force to overcome it. The plan outlined by the vanguard troops was as follows. Although they were unable to eliminate Hela, it was imperative to impede her progress as much as possible. At this moment, Thanos, accompanied by General Deathblade, was approaching the downed mothership. Provided he was able to access the mothership, Thanos could utilize it for his escape. As long as he remains alive, Thanos retains the potential for a resurgence. Hela observed this situation keenly, and she was determined not to allow Thanos to escape unchallenged. However, the vanguard troops, engaged in a fierce battle, caused Hela to frown. In the following moment, Hela elevated the sword she held and directed it towards the sky. Shortly thereafter, a vibrant beam of light penetrated the clouds and descended to the earth. The Rainbow Bridge, Asgard's renowned weapon, effectively neutralized the vanguard upon its emergence. As the light of the Rainbow Bridge began to fade, Thor, imbued with thunder and rune magic, swiftly emerged from the Rainbow Bridge. He ascended abruptly into the air, then descended forcefully. The continuous thunderclaps intensified, evolving into numerous thunderstorms that radiated outward into the surrounding area. Rune magic flourished remarkably, akin to the emergence of a sun illuminating the earth. As the lights and thunder converged, Thor's presence emerged. Within a radius of 10,000 meters from Thor, all vanguard troops vanished entirely. They were reduced to dust. In honor of Asgard, Thor let out a powerful roar, and as his voice diminished, numerous Asgard warriors emerged from the Rainbow Bridge. The unexpected emergence of Asgard's army altered the dynamics on the battlefield. The superhero group, previously facing challenges in mutual support, unexpectedly found that the pressure from the surrounding vanguard troops had significantly diminished. Shortly thereafter, Asgard's forces arrived and eliminated all the vanguard troops that had surrounded the superheroes, ensuring their protection. Hulk and Captain Marvel took a moment to unwind, as both were feeling somewhat fatigued. The unexpected emergence of Asgard's army simultaneously garnered Thanos' attention. As he sprinted towards the mothership, he glanced back and observed Asgard's army descending from the sky. At this moment, Thanos experienced profound sorrow. He recognized that he was entirely overcome in this conflict. He sustained severe injuries, and the vanguard troops who accompanied him in every conflict were also decimated during this period. This impact caused Thanos' eyes to nearly turn red. However, Thanos was also aware of the reality of remaining in the Green Hills. As long as he could survive, he had the opportunity to begin anew. He found it challenging to acknowledge defeat, as he still had a significant ideal to achieve. However, in the next instant, a figure of divine stature emerged before Thanos. Naruto was the one who had previously vanished. Following the defeat of Eternity's clone, Naruto made his way back to Earth. He successfully obstructed Thanos' escape. Observing the formidable Thanos before him, Naruto's gaze hardened with intensity. Despite Thanos' failure on this occasion, Naruto would not regard him lightly. This individual exemplified true heroism. If he misjudged him, he would inevitably face significant consequences in the future. 
If Naruto lacked sufficient strength, he would have faced fatal consequences at the hands of Thanos. It is surprising to consider that Thanos would align himself with the Celestial Group with the intent of ending Naruto's life. Thanos, the situation has reached its conclusion. Your outcome is unfavorable. Naruto stated. His tone was neutral, resembling the delivery of a factual statement. Upon observing Naruto's presence, a fleeting expression of despair crossed Thanos' face. Considering Naruto's appearance, it is difficult to understand how Thanos could remain unaware of the situation that had transpired. Naruto had made his appearance however, the absence of the Celestials clarified the issue at hand. Initially, he believed that the backing of the Celestial Group would ensure a straightforward victory in this critical battle. However, reality delivered a significant blow to Thanos. Naruto eliminated all members of the Celestial Group he depended on, ensuring that none survived. Simultaneously, Naruto's presence indicated that Thanos had no opportunity for escape. It appears that I have not succeeded. Upon recognizing his fate, Thanos expressed his reluctance. The momentum of his body abruptly diminished, as though he had expended all his energy in an instant, resulting in a sudden appearance of age. Upon observing Naruto, Proxima Midnight, positioned alongside Thanos, advanced towards Naruto wielding her weapon. Despite her awareness of Naruto's formidable strength and her complete lack of opportunity for victory, Proxima Midnight chose not to withdraw. Sitting and waiting for demise, being treated like livestock was not the approach of Thanos' subordinates. As Proxima Midnight approached him with haste, Naruto's expression remained unchanged. He respected Proxima Midnight's bravery in her bold decision to confront him. However, this did not imply that Naruto would show any mercy. Naruto had never considered the option of showing mercy when confronting his adversaries. Proxima Midnight, who was hurrying forward, came to an abrupt halt with a gentle sigh. She was eliminated by Naruto in a moment. Upon witnessing this scene, General Deathblade's eyes became crimson. General Deathblade and Proxima Midnight were the sole couple among the five Obsidian Generals, and they shared a profound relationship. Having witnessed the tragic demise of his lover, General Deathblade felt a compelling urge to confront Naruto with unwavering determination. However, given the disparity in strength between the two sides, and his continued support for Thanos, General Deathblade restrained himself from acting on this impulse. Simultaneously, Thanos experienced profound sorrow as he gazed upon Proxima Midnight, who lay deceased before him, and a fleeting moment of self-reproach crossed his expression. Thanos was not an entity devoid of emotions. His emotions were akin to those of the general populace. While Thanos maintained a strict demeanor with his subordinates, it did not imply a lack of concern for their well-being. Having witnessed the general, who had been a constant presence in his life for many years, pass away in such a manner, it is understandable that Thanos would feel a profound sense of heartbreak. Nevertheless, he could not attribute the responsibility to anyone else. Ultimately, it was Thanos who initiated this conflict. When Thanos deployed his forces to Earth, he ought to have considered the implications of this day. Thanos' subordinates ought to have anticipated the possibility of facing consequences for their actions against the Earthlings. General Deathblade intervened with a vanguard soldier from Thanos' army, requesting his support for Thanos. He then communicated briefly with the vanguard soldier. Upon receiving his command, the vanguard soldier promptly aligned with Thanos and proceeded towards the mothership. General Deathblade unsheathed his weapon and regarded Naruto with a serious expression. It was clear that he intended to restrain Naruto independently, aiming to facilitate Thanos' departure. A dark red bloodstain remained on his weapon, showing no signs of fading. The blood of the people of Earth and the superheroes who battled alongside General Deathblade was present. I respect your bravery however, it would have been prudent to consider the current circumstances before initiating the conflict. Everyone must meet their end here. None of you are able to escape. Naruto regarded General Deathblade with a frigid expression. His appreciation for General Deathblade reflected a recognition of loyalty to Thanos however, it did not imply that Naruto would grant him freedom. Ultimately, General Deathblade's hands bore the marks of innocent lives lost. I understand that I am not your adversary, yet my sense of pride prevents me from submitting or pleading for leniency. 
If my conclusion is death, I desire it to be a departure that leaves me without regrets. General Deathblade responded with a stoic expression. His tone conveyed a resolute commitment to persevere until the end. Following his statement, General Deathblade brandished the weapon in his hand and advanced towards Naruto. The weapon wielded by General Deathblade was meticulously crafted. It was not only exceptionally sharp, but it also contained his essence. As long as General Deathblade's weapon remained intact, he was invulnerable to death. Regardless of the numerous times his body was damaged, it would remain unaffected. This, however, did not equate to Naruto's immortality. The immortality of General Deathblade exhibited significant flaws. As long as his weapon was rendered inoperative, he would meet his demise. Consequently, when Naruto sees General Deathblade's weapon, General Deathblade experienced a moment of panic. He was taken aback that Naruto could discern his intricacies instantly and identify his most significant vulnerability. Eliminate! Observing the astonished General Deathblade, Naruto spoke with a chilling demeanor. He decisively crushed General Deathblade's weapon with his fingers. Given Naruto's current strength, any matter was exceedingly delicate in his grasp. He could potentially defeat Eternity's clone, not to mention the weapon wielded by General Deathblade. Absolutely not! General Deathblade gazed at his shattered weapon, overwhelmed by a sense of despair. Subsequently, the body gradually diminished and ultimately vanished entirely. Confronted with overwhelming power, General Deathblade found himself unable to mount any form of resistance. He could only select a dignified approach to his demise. Following the destruction of General Deathblade's weapon, Naruto grasped the remnants in his hand and averted his gaze. A soldier of the Vanguard assisted Thanos in making his way towards the mothership. A number of Vanguard soldiers emerged from the rear and positioned themselves in front of Naruto and Thanos. A hint of disdain appeared in Naruto's eyes as he nonchalantly discarded the fragments of the weapon he held. Due to Naruto's power, these fragments swiftly transformed into lethal sickles. They efficiently penetrated the air and eliminated all the Vanguard soldiers with remarkable speed. Thanos fell to the ground, rendered helpless due to the absence of support from the Vanguard soldier. Thanos' legs remained impaled by Hela's sword, rendering him unable to act autonomously. Following the withdrawal of his support, he struggled to maintain his balance independently. However, Thanos remained composed. In contrast, he gradually rotated his body, seated himself on the ground, and observed Naruto as he walked by. A fleeting expression of profound sorrow appeared in Thanos' eyes. The existence of this overlord, responsible for unprecedented devastation across the universe, was nearing its conclusion. Simultaneously, Hela approached from a distance and positioned herself alongside Naruto. There are no injuries, correct? Upon seeing Naruto, Hela inquired with a sense of concern. While Hela had confidence in Naruto's abilities, the fact that his opponent was the Celestial Group caused her to feel a sense of concern. Hela expressed her relief upon observing that Naruto was unharmed. Certainly, I am fine. I have even eliminated a clone of Eternity. You performed well. Naruto responded to Hela and held her small hand with ease. Hela experienced a brief moment of embarrassment. She exhibited a degree of shyness, yet she did not express any objections and permitted Naruto to hold her hand. Simultaneously, Naruto's remarks also took Hela by surprise. If Naruto claimed that he had dismantled the Celestial Group, she would still be able to accept it. However, Naruto stated that he had successfully eliminated Eternity's clone, which exceeded Hela's expectations significantly. She understood that Eternity was among the five deities, and he represented an unparalleled force, positioned at the pinnacle of the universe. Even if it were a clone of such an entity, it would undoubtedly possess significant power. The ease with which Naruto eliminated such a formidable adversary left Hela momentarily astonished. However, Hela soon experienced a profound sense of pride. This individual was her partner, and he possessed considerable influence. Naruto was unaware of Hela's psychological processes. At this moment, he was grasping Hela's hand and proceeding steadily toward Thanos. 
Observing Thanos seated on the ground in a defeated posture, Naruto chose not to act hastily in delivering a fatal blow. You are commendable, and even as a rival, I acknowledge your capabilities. Naruto observed Thanos with a measured gaze. This statement was entirely genuine and not misleading in any way. While Naruto may not have aligned with Thanos' ideals, he certainly acknowledged the merit of his opponent. Thanos exemplified heroism, displaying a remarkable level of charisma. Otherwise, his subordinates would not exhibit such desperation, and the vanguard troops would not position themselves before Thanos as if they were at home with death. Given this alone, Thanos warranted Naruto's respect. However, this did not imply that Naruto would allow Thanos to escape. Thank you for your assistance. I am honored to be acknowledged as your opponent. Thanos spoke to Naruto in a deliberate and earnest manner. Despite Thanos' defeat in this pivotal battle, there was a clear lack of suspense regarding his loss. Nonetheless, this did not hinder Thanos from holding Naruto in high regard. Ultimately, Naruto acted without deception or reliance on external influences. Instead, he depended on his own capabilities and dismantled his plan with dignity and honor. How is it possible for such an influential individual to lack respect? It is unfortunate that my ideal may not come to fruition in the end. I have sacrificed significantly for this ideal, yet I faltered at the final stage. Your absence would not result in my loss. Thanos expressed his sentiments with reluctance. He exhibited a composed demeanor, yet displayed a reluctance. There was no disagreement between these two points. His reluctance was understandable. Ultimately, he paid a significant price and even took the life of his adopted daughter, whom he valued deeply, yet he still faced failure. One could argue that Thanos sacrificed everything for his vision. He was not a dreamer who made empty promises rather, he was a man of action dedicated to putting in every effort to achieve his aspirations. Without Naruto, Thanos would have likely achieved his objectives. Avengers 3 could potentially be titled Thanos 1. Furthermore, Thanos did not gather the six Infinity Stones for personal gain. This is evident in the manner in which he dispassionately opted to eliminate half of the life in the universe at random. Upon attaining his ideal, he did not seek the power of the Infinity Stones. He directly eliminated the six Infinity Stones. It is evident that his actions were driven not by the pursuit of Infinity Stones, but by his ideals. The Infinity Stones served merely as a means for him to realize his vision. Based on this alone, Thanos demonstrated sufficient qualifications to earn Naruto's respect. However, this hero's life was nearing its conclusion. Thanos will now fully withdraw from the Marvel Universe, adhering to his principles. The opportunity has concluded, and there are no further chances for a return. As an adversary, I will defeat you personally to demonstrate my respect for you. Naruto addressed Thanos with a grave demeanor. Despite being an adversary, Naruto demonstrated a willingness to extend respect towards Thanos. He was distinct from the others who perished at Naruto's hands, and he did not even take the time to glance at them more than once. Thanos acknowledged his destiny. He ceased to struggle and accepted the situation with composure. He observed the scenery on the earth with a sense of nostalgia, taking in the harsh battlefield and the setting sun. I would appreciate your assistance in accomplishing what I have yet to achieve. This is intended for the universe. Only equilibrium can ensure the survival of the universe. Thanos addressed Naruto with a tone that conveyed a sense of urgency. He anticipated that Naruto would realize his ideals and accomplish what he was unable to achieve. Nonetheless, Naruto remained unresponsive. He showed no interest in Thanos' ideals whatsoever. While he did not necessarily disagree with Thanos' vision, he lacked the motivation to pursue it. Regardless of the universe's potential destruction, what relevance did it hold for him? Given Naruto's strength, a restart of the universe would have no impact on him. Naruto has the capability to safeguard Hela and Asgard as well. What is the rationale for Naruto to invest effort if the universe is destined for destruction due to expansion? He was neither a superhero nor a messenger of justice, which contributed to his lack of motivation to take action. Naruto, without responding to Thanos' request, activated his powers and unleashed a concentrated beam of heat vision, resulting in Thanos' demise. 
the Overlord, who had existed in the universe for numerous years, has passed away today. He passed away while advocating for his principles. It has concluded. Thanos has been eliminated. Naruto stated with a sense of detachment, and Hala acknowledged with a nod. The demise of Thanos marked the long-awaited retribution for Nidavella. The dwarfs who fell victim to Thanos can now find their peace. Subsequently, Hala approached Thanos' body and retrieved the final two Infinity Stones from his Infinity Gauntlet. The Power Stone and the Soul Stone were present. Hala has successfully gathered all six Infinity Stones to date. She merely needed to create an Infinity Gauntlet, and Hala would obtain power second only to the five gods. The reason she did not grab Thanos' Infinity Gauntlet was since Hala almost cut it into pieces during the last fight. Let's go, everything is over. Naruto lost interest as he saw the dead Thanos and the harsh battleground nearby. Since his initial encounter with Thanos, he had always planned to murder him. Naruto was perplexed for a while after Thanos died in his hands. It was like achieving one goal and then being unable to locate the next for a long. However, this bewilderment was brief, and Naruto recovered swiftly. Then Naruto grabbed Hela's hand, established a space channel, and vanished from the battlefield. Only Thanos and numerous corpses from the conflict remained. At the same time, the vanguard forces on the battlefield were almost depleted. When Asgard joined the conflict, the warriors of the vanguard army were already at a complete disadvantage. They were just battling against the odds by this point, thus it was reasonable to expect them to be wiped out shortly. The superheroes had no need to battle anymore. They only needed to heal slowly. Nick Fury monitored the situation on the battlefield via the satellite video screen at the faraway SHIELD headquarters. Nick Fury's eyes faded as he looked at the bodies. He was very saddened by the deaths. Humans did not win this fight. Although Thanos' army was set to be annihilated, mankind had already paid a high price. Not only were all of the armies destroyed, but the superheroes that fought in the fight also suffered significant casualties. The Human Torch of the Fantastic Four, a close friend of Captain America, Winter Soldier, and the War Machine Colonel Rhodes. Many superheroes have lost their lives as a result of the battle. That is how the conflict was. It was very horrible. If they were irresponsible, even a superhero would perish. And Naruto's presence caused these superheroes to lose their halo. They could no longer convert adversity into opportunity instead, they would bleed and sacrifice. Thanos' fight came to an end when he died. Even once the conflict was over, humanity did not feel any pleasure. Because in this struggle, success was too terrible. With almost half a million dead and no survivors, all soldiers that went to combat were eliminated. The superhero took significant casualties. Hulk and Captain Marvel were the only superheroes that were fatigued but unharmed by the conflict. In the end, even at this level, humans had failed. Because the vanguard forces already had control of the situation at the time. If Hela hadn't crushed Thanos, and the Asgardian army hadn't intervened, the Earth would have collapsed. As a result, even if Thanos perished and the vanguard army was decimated, mankind were not happy. Instead, numerous people spontaneously took to the streets to honor the warriors who gave their lives in this conflict. The struggle was so sad that it surpassed everyone's expectations. These individuals could envision the enemy's strength, even if they just huddled in subterranean bases and stared at the frigid figures. For once, no one was discussing the state's ineptitude or the military's ineffectiveness. Everyone saw the country's and the military's efforts. And the superheroes. They were deserving of their status, worthy of universal adoration and admiration. Countless individuals saw each superhero's death in combat. Countless people prayed for the superheroes who had been gravely hurt. Humans were a pretty weird species. They might do unfathomable, idiotic things out of greed. However, they might twist into a rope and operate together in the event of a tragedy. After the effect of this fight, all criticisms against superheroes vanished. Everyone understood that superheroes were named by their character rather than their skills. With a mortal body that is akin to a god's. This was the secret bright point in humans. 
Even in the face of an unstoppable foe, mankind would not flee. The anthem of bravery was also a hymn to mankind. In addition to the people who were spontaneously praying for the superheroes, US authorities were discussing another issue at the same time. It was about what Thanos' army left behind on Earth after the conflict. This time, the battle served as both a crisis and a chance for the Earth. As long as mankind can assimilate Thanos' army's residual technologies, human science and technology will advance many levels. Unfortunately, Asgard stole Thanos' army's most important space mothership. This was also typical. After all, Asgard has less experience creating huge spaceships than Earth. They would not pass up the opportunity to make amends now that it had arisen. In addition to the greatest mothership, the Asgardians took Theon's body. Hela arranged for him to be buried in Asgard. This was her respect for Thanos, whom she deemed a worthy opponent, and she would not allow his remains to be desecrated. If left on Earth, Thanos' corpse would very certainly be dissected for study. However, Asgard only removed the greatest mothership and Thanos' body. The remainder remained on Earth. Even the items that remained on Earth were a great source of riches for the world's countries. Aside from that, the cone-shaped landing chambers were quite beneficial. The research of the materials used in these landing chambers was enough to propel the human material industry to new heights. There were also several weapons and the corpses of the vanguard soldiers. All of these assets were sufficient to compensate for humanity's losses during this epic battle. However, top US officials were likewise concerned about this issue at the time. Now we will start to vote by show of hands. Whether to hide the wealth left by Thanos' army for our research or share it with other countries to jointly improve the scientific and technological level of mankind. Mr. President, who had just taken office as President Trump's successor, stated this to certain top US congressional and military officials. Everyone soon voted by show of hands, and the outcome was that the latter received the majority of the votes. In other words, the United States would distribute the money left by the Vanguard's troops to all nations on the Earth. It may seem that the United States was unable to do so, yet this was the case. In truth, it was rather straightforward. The United States, which had recently fought a major conflict, could not keep these riches. Among other things, the majority of the United States aircraft carrier fleets and fighter fighters were wrecked during this battle. The United States, having lost its dominance over the sea and air, had long ago forfeited its status as the world's leader. Although no nation has yet requested that the United States return Thanos' army technology, it was just a matter of time. Instead of giving it up under pressure from others, it was preferable to take the initiative and leave a positive reputation. Furthermore, they had to evaluate the impact of giving up Thanos' army's residual technology on all mankind. After three consecutive extraterrestrial invasions, many nations on Earth understood that the period of human civil conflict was over. Humanity had fully entered the interstellar era, and it was about to compete with many cosmic species for a position in the cosmos. As a result, at this point, the notion of the nation was hazy, but the concept of humanity grew clearer. In reality, this was consistent with human nature. When there was no powerful opponent, humanity began battling inside. However, if there was an opponent who might endanger all of mankind, people would band together and kill the foreigner first. It was never too late to wait till the foreigners died before fighting domestically. Nick Fury was unconcerned about disputes between high-level officials from various nations. Something else was bothering him just now. With the conclusion of the struggle against Thanos, mankind suffered a significant setback. The superheroes had also experienced significant losses. Almost every main member of the Avengers had sustained major injuries and would be unable to recuperate in a timely manner. So, who will stop these supervillains? Nick Fury could already picture these supervillains causing havoc in the future. The good news was that Captain Marvel was still on Earth and had decided to remain for a while. This also eased Nick Fury much. At least he didn't have to worry about the supervillains jumping out and causing problems with no one to protect them. However, after dealing with the supervillains, Nick Fury was confronted with a new and terrible challenge. That was Asgard. Asgard's present reputation on Earth has reached an atrocious level after saving the Earth twice in catastrophic situations. 
it had even evolved into a whole new kind of religion among the people. Everyone praised Asgard. It had even become a cultural phenomena. This was certainly not good news for Nick Fury. Asgard's reputation among the people became stronger, making it more difficult for humanity to escape its rule. Nick Fury had no doubt that if Asgard stepped up and declared their intention to overrun Earth, the people would still rejoice joyfully. Nick Fury was plagued by the idea that he lacked any initiative. He wanted Asgard to understand that the Earth was not a place they could govern at will. But Nick Fury couldn't do it. He didn't dare to turn against Asgard. He had not forgotten about the buried part of the land. It did not happen long ago. If he provoked Asgard, perhaps they would simply drown the entire continent to the bottom of the sea. However, Hela had no desire to govern the Earth. For so many years, Asgard has controlled the Nine Realms without turning any of them into colonies. In reality, Asgard only wants to be the ruler of the Nine Realms. As long as its subordinates were obedient and recognized it as the boss, Asgard would not be concerned about their lives. Hela covertly controlled Hydra just to facilitate her and Naruto's actions on Earth. She also buried a nail to ensure that the Earth remained dominion. Nick Fury just wasn't aware of everything. Even if he knew it, Nick Fury would remain vigilant against Asgard. In his perspective, Asgard had a notion of Earth, but it lacked the capability. As long as something could endanger the Earth, it was his imagined adversary. Nick Fury's head ached again as he reflected about this. In the fight against Thanos, both Thanos and Earth were defeated. There was only one true winner, and it was Asgard. Not to add that Asgard had not suffered any losses, and it received the greatest items left by Thanos' army. Not to mention Asgard's immense status and good reputation on Earth. The fact that Hela had Thanos' two Infinity Stones was already a significant gain. Following this combat, Hela was the one to obtain the six Infinity Stones. With the Infinity Stones in her hands, Hela's strength had increased dramatically, ranking second only to the five gods in one fell swoop. This was enough to compensate for Asgard's defeat. Hela, unlike Thanos, was not an idealist. She had become quite lazy. If it were the original Hela, after obtaining the six Infinity Stones, she would discover a means to fulfill her desires. However, after spending so much time with Naruto, Hela had changed. She had gotten lazy. Her current goal was to live happily with Naruto and gain the power to protect Asgard and Naruto. So, after receiving the six Infinity Stones, Hela did not utilize them to achieve anything further. Instead, she returned to the remote island with Naruto, like she always did. Naruto was at this point contemplating his future. Naruto had temporarily lost sight of his aim after Thanos' death. At the very least, he no longer had to worry about how to unscrew Thanos' head every day. He had already screwed off Thanos' head. But soon, he remembered the Celestial Group. The Celestial Group and Naruto had a wholly antagonistic relationship and were mortal foes. The past two strikes against Naruto demonstrated the Celestial Group's desire to remove him. In this situation, the Celestial Group's third attack would most likely occur in the future. So Naruto came up with an idea. Now that he didn't have an aim, why not annoy the Celestial Bunch on his own? Naruto disliked difficulty. He seldom asked for problems. However, the Celestial Group was an exception. If he did not address the Celestial Group's situation, he would face a steady stream of difficulties in the future. And when the Celestial Group arrived, their lineup would be far more powerful than the previous two attacks. This was clear from the fact that the Celestial Group initially dispatched five Celestials, followed by 30,000 Celestials the second time. The Celestial Group's ambition to eliminate Naruto was tremendous. Of course, Naruto was unafraid of the Celestial Group's current power, but what about Hela? What about Asgard? The Celestial Group's strength was undeniable. Although there were weak Celestials, the weakest Celestial was equivalent to a Heavenly Father level. Not to add that many powerful persons in the Celestial Group ranked just behind the five great gods. Even if Asgard only faced one opponent of such magnitude, it would be unable to withstand. Even if Hela possessed six Infinity Stones, her safety was not guaranteed. 
Didn't Thanos have six Infinity Stones, but he was nearly murdered by Thor with an axe. After all, the power conferred by the alien thing was not personal strength, and only one's own strength was the most secure. Naruto would not allow the Celestial Group a third chance to attack. Because Naruto would not allow Hela to be in danger. It seems that I have to go and visit the Celestial Group someday. Naruto thought inside and decided to destroy the Celestial Organization as his next aim. Rather of passively waiting for the Celestial Gang to assault him, it was preferable to take the initiative to locate them. In addition, Naruto had to deal with even more formidable adversaries, the Five Gods. When Naruto destroyed Eternity's clone, the conflict between him and the Five Gods became insurmountable. The two sides would finally engage in combat. Despite his lack of fear, Naruto struggled to ensure that he could protect Hela from the menace of the Five Great Gods. At the very least, simply using the Silver Superman body pattern wasn't adequate. Unless Naruto can obtain more, more stronger body templates. Of all, this was merely a random gift from the system, and he did not lay all his expectations in it. What he intended to do was take the initiative and pursue the five gods himself, drawing their attention to him. This was also consistent with Naruto's customary manner. He didn't want to cause problems, but he was pleased to fix them. Thinking about this, Naruto had already set a goal for himself in the future. First, slay the five gods. Anyway, they were already adversaries and will eventually fight each other. Hala affectionately massaged Naruto's firmly furrowed brow. Hala knew Naruto was under a lot of strain. But Hala recognized how tough it was for her to assist Naruto in this circumstance. She could only soothe Naruto in her own way. Of course, Hala was willing to join Naruto in challenging the five gods. This explains why Hala gathered the six infinity stones. Only with immense strength could she truly aid Naruto. One month later, Earth's order had restored to normal. War with Thanos had a significant influence, yet it resulted in minimal harm. Finally, it was because the battleground remained within range and did not spread. Although there were many deaths, the major cities in the United States were not significantly damaged. This was also the primary reason the United States order could be restored in such a short amount of time. The war with Thanos resulted in losses that were not even equal to the previous two extraterrestrial invasions. However, the effects of this battle were far-reaching. This war encouraged full collaboration among all countries on Earth, and human knowledge and technology improved by leaps and bounds. Furthermore, Thanos' army left behind numerous corpses, providing researchers from many countries with enough experimental materials. At the same time, the Thanos army prompted all of humanity to focus more on the production of biological DNA. They planned to establish an army of superheroes who belonged to humanity, similar to the vanguard forces. There was no need for the superheroes army to be overly powerful. It would be sufficient if every one of them possessed Captain America's might. As a result, the once-forgotten super-soldier serum experiment resurfaced as a hot issue in the scientific study community. Even the United States deliberately provided all accessible data so that other nations may study together. Why did Captain America conduct his super-soldier serum experiment? Of course, this was the easiest option. Of course, trials like Hulk serum and Spider-Man serum were also underway. It's only that the super-soldier serum experiments were more common and included a broader spectrum of individuals. A fact, the super-soldier serum resulting from these studies was considerably more sophisticated. Some academicians had even developed a super-soldier serum that claimed to have 10,000 times the effectiveness. They aimed to build a superhero 10,000 times more powerful than Captain America. However, the negative effects of this serum were 10,000 times that of super-soldier serum. Captain America became a superhero after using the Super Soldier Serum, yet he was almost always in danger of dying. And when this risk was multiplied by 10,000, one could only imagine how slim the chances of success were. Even if everyone consumed a vial of this serum, no one would likely live in the end. The likelihood of generating such a Superman was exponentially closer to zero. On the contrary, the chances of a violent death were about 100. However, this was the Marvel Universe. 
In the Marvel Universe, occurrences with a low probability were more likely to happen. A drug addict who had gotten into the laboratory consumed this pharmaceutical, which promised to have 10,000 times the impact of Super Soldier Serum. The most crucial point was that Robert Reynolds, a heroin addict, did not die after drinking this serum. Instead, he fully integrated with the effects of this serum and transformed into a superhero. This superhero possessed an unparalleled energy source, equivalent to that of a million stars combined. The superhero was named Sentry. At the moment of the Sentry's birth, Naruto rose from the rocking chair with a distinct ting sound. He then directed his gaze towards the west, the direction of the United States. At this moment, Naruto sensed the emergence of a formidable force on Earth. The magnitude of this power was such that even Naruto experienced the pressure it exerted. Even in the presence of Eternity's clone, Naruto did not experience such immense pressure. Could this signify the emergence of an extraordinary superhero? Naruto contemplated internally, recognizing the likelihood of this situation. The superheroes of the Marvel Universe emerged in a manner that can be described as informal, with a notable correlation between the casualness of their origins and the strength of their combat abilities. Naruto had even somewhat inferred the identity of the superhero originating from the United States. The ability to harness such a formidable force from its inception suggests a strong likelihood that it is Sentry. It is important to clarify that this Sentry is not referencing the Sentry from the X-Men, but rather the superhero known as Sentry. Sentry has embodied the formidable energy of over one million stars since its inception. The body exhibited remarkable strength, approaching invincibility, while also demonstrating a range of superpowers. In summary, he was regarded as the golden Superman within the Marvel Universe. This was standard practice. The most unusual aspect of Sentry was that, despite being at the golden Superman level, he possessed a more formidable form known as Void. Upon entering the Void form, Sentry's body becomes linked to a unique universe characterized by boundless energy. It is important to clarify that it was the universe, not dimension. This was distinctly different from the Dark Lord, Dormammu. Upon establishing a connection to that specific universe, Sentry's energy would be boundless. It is conceivable that even the five gods may struggle to achieve victory against Sentry. Naruto experienced pressure when facing such an opponent. Fortunately, Sentry recognized his own strength, which led him to exercise restraint. This was also the primary reason for Sentry's numerous defeats in the comics. Sentry would be invincible if not for the need to restrain the power within him and prevent Void from wreaking havoc on the world. A formidable presence had emerged among the superheroes, leaving him uncertain about its implications. Certainly, while Naruto expressed concern regarding the Sentry, he remained unafraid. Sentry's strength was formidable, yet Naruto demonstrated considerable resilience as well. Utilizing the three primary body templates, Naruto is capable of contending with the five gods. What could possibly cause him to fear the Sentry? Addressing such an opponent would pose significant challenges for Naruto. Naruto preferred to avoid conflict. The Sentry that appeared unexpectedly not only apprehended Naruto's his presence was also acknowledged by Nick Fury. Nick Fury was the first to be informed of Sentry's birth, as the immense energy that suddenly manifested could not be hidden. Is this another deity? Nick Fury observed the detected energy level and remarked, seemingly in a state of disbelief. Nick Fury was not overreacting the data detected was indeed extraordinary. The data indicates that the sudden emergence of this energy was comparable to the energy generated by the explosion of one million suns. That was truly remarkable. Nick Fury questioned the functionality of the energy detection machine. Nonetheless, this was sufficient to capture Nick Fury's attention towards Sentry. Without delay, Nick Fury informed Captain Marvel and requested her assistance in addressing the situation with Sentry. Captain Marvel promptly accepted the task and swiftly proceeded to Sentry's location. The newly born Sentry observed his body with a sense of astonishment. His physique, once characterized by a slender frame due to substance misuse, has now transformed into a robust and muscular build. Simultaneously, there appeared to be an immense power within the body, readily accessible for his use. Sentry experienced a significant sense of surprise. He possessed a robust ambition to evaluate his own capabilities. 
Subsequently, Sentry grasped a piece of steel and applied a gentle pressure with his hand. The hard steel was effortlessly crushed into a ball by Sentry. It is quite impressive. I have also taken on the role of a superhero now. Sentry felt a profound sense of joy within. Despite his struggles with addiction, he still held aspirations of becoming a superhero. With the realization of his dream, Sentry's excitement was evident. However, shortly thereafter, Sentry made contact with his head once more. He contemplated the name he should adopt, now that he had acquired power and assumed the role of a superhero. Is that Superman? Or Mega Man? Ultimately, he adopted the superhero name, Sentry. Shortly after he settled on his name, a woman with blonde hair entered the laboratory unexpectedly. She then observed Sentry levitating and radiating significant energy. The individual who infiltrated the laboratory was Captain Marvel. The unexpected arrival of Captain Marvel took Sentry by surprise. Ultimately, his present condition was atypical. Additionally, were superheroes not meant to conceal their identities? Otherwise, the repercussions of the previous Ultron incident were likely to resurface due to his actions. Furthermore, Sentry was uncertain about his decision to either join the Avengers or revert to his former life. Consequently, upon witnessing the unexpected arrival of Captain Marvel, it was natural for him to experience a degree of panic. In moments of panic, individuals may exhibit irrational behavior, such as fleeing the situation. In Captain Marvel's astonished gaze, Sentry immediately ascended, breaking through the ceiling and an indeterminate number of floors above before soaring outward. This resolute demeanor led Captain Marvel to experience some uncertainty regarding life. She was undeniably attractive, yet it raises the question of why Sentry fled as though confronted by a terrifying presence. Furthermore, if Sentry were to operate in this manner, it would have implications for public security. Captain Marvel pursued him. She could not allow a formidable entity such as Sentry to roam freely outside. Following his escape, Sentry covered a considerable distance in an instant. Upon regaining his awareness, he realized that he was already positioned above the Atlantic Ocean. As he gazed at the vast expanse of the sea beneath him, Sentry was left in a state of astonishment. He had recently acquired this power and was unable to manage it effectively. That is the reason he inadvertently flew such a long distance. The golden light in the distance swiftly approached him, marking a significant moment. As it came to a halt before him, the silhouette of Captain Marvel was unveiled. This led Sentry to believe that Captain Marvel was present to apprehend him. Messages circulating on the internet suggest that the military would pursue lesser-known superheroes for the purpose of conducting various experiments. The outcome of the experimental subject was, understandably, quite tragic. Furthermore, Sentry had a history of substance abuse prior to acquiring his powers, which understandably led to his apprehension regarding the authorities. Upon seeing the police, he would experience a profound sense of fear. At this moment, upon seeing Captain Marvel, who possessed an official background, Sentry experienced a sense of panic. Captain Marvel approached him at a measured pace. From Sentry's perspective, it was evident that her intention was to engage and seize him. Captain Marvel aimed to reassure this anxious individual. With a heavy conscience and the weight of history looming, Sentry struck Captain Marvel as she approached. This action was solely for self-defense, as he aimed to avoid being apprehended by Captain Marvel. However, Sentry was unaware of the extent of his strength. Following the punch, Captain Marvel's expression shifted. Due to the unexpected nature of Sentry's sudden attack, Captain Marvel was unable to adequately defend herself. She managed to cross her arms in front of her to defend against Sentry's punch. Subsequently, Captain Marvel was forcefully displaced. The significant impact of this punch propelled Captain Marvel a distance of tens of thousands of meters. Simultaneously, the seawater beneath was also separated into two due to Sentry's strike. A linear formation emerged in the ocean. Sentry was taken aback after delivering this punch. He was taken aback to realize that the situation before him resulted from his punch. Captain Marvel, who was significantly impacted by him, did not fare as well. Despite her defense, she ultimately lacked preparation. 
Furthermore, Sentry was unaware of his own strength, which hindered his ability to manage it effectively. Consequently, his punch propelled Captain Marvel through the air. Simultaneously, all the bones in Captain Marvel's arms and hands fractured, and the organs within her body experienced significant trauma. Her hands were severely deformed as a result of the impact, and she also expelled several mouthfuls of blood. In a single blow, Captain Marvel, recognized as Earth's most formidable hero, sustained significant injuries. Nevertheless, Captain Marvel exhibited considerable strength, and her injuries were healing rapidly. Simultaneously, Captain Marvel's frustration was steadily escalating. She contemplated whether her attitude was appropriate. She simply aimed to engage in a meaningful conversation with Sentry. It is surprising that Sentry chose to disregard her and launch an attack. She determined that it was prudent to first restrain such a cruel and dangerous individual. She would seek retribution for the recent altercation. Captain Marvel, the originator of this concept, soon reappeared before Sentry. This time, Captain Marvel delivered a decisive punch to Sentry's cheek, demonstrating a shift in demeanor. Sentry was propelled thousands of meters away. Nevertheless, Sentry shook his head and determined that there was nothing amiss with him. The analysis indicated a significant disparity in strength between Sentry and Captain Marvel. Nevertheless, Captain Marvel was determined not to let it pass. With a clear intent to confront him, she swiftly advanced towards Sentry. Nevertheless, Sentry responded and once more struck her. The fists of both parties met with significant impact, generating a shockwave that created a deep indentation in the seawater beneath. A tsunami was generated, reaching heights of hundreds of meters, with the seabed also becoming exposed. At the location where the two super heat visions converged, numerous dimensions were being obliterated. Overall, Naruto once again maintained the advantage. The intense red super heat vision surpassed the crimson super heat vision. This demonstrated that the unauthorized version still could not surpass the legitimate one. Upon witnessing this scene, Sentry's anger intensified. He exerted every ounce of energy within him, striving to contain Naruto. The Sentry possessed boundless energy however, unbeknownst to him, Naruto shared the same limitless vitality. Despite Sentry's diligent efforts, he continued to face setbacks. Ultimately, it was evident that, in terms of physical strength or superpower, Naruto surpassed Sentry. Sentry had no chance of defeating Naruto whatsoever. Ultimately, the pirated Superman was unable to surpass Naruto, the authentic Superman. Soon, Naruto's advanced heat vision repelled the pirated version and precisely struck Sentry, resulting in the melting of his head. Sentry's physical strength clearly could not endure the intense heat vision capable of annihilating atoms. However, Sentry was not so easily defeated. His wounds were consistently healing. In a brief moment, Sentry regained composure and once more positioned himself before Naruto. Observing this situation, even Naruto had to concede that Sentry was undeniably a formidable adversary. Sentry exhibited weaknesses in every regard, yet he remained a challenging opponent to overcome. Nevertheless, Naruto exhibited no fear. If he could not eliminate him immediately, then he would ensure his demise a thousand times or even ten thousand times. Naruto was confident that he would ultimately defeat Sentry. Despite experiencing two consecutive losses, Sentry remained resolute and did not surrender. He advanced swiftly towards Naruto once more. On this occasion, he channeled his energy into a whip, successfully piercing through numerous planets. With a decisive pull, he forcefully maneuvered and propelled numerous planets towards Naruto. Sentry effortlessly maneuvered numerous planets at will. Certainly, Naruto exhibited similar traits. Naruto exhaled deeply as he observed the planets on a collision course with him. Subsequently, a powerful cosmic storm emerged, causing the numerous planets hurtling towards Naruto to be repelled. However, Sentry had already made preparations to launch an attack from behind those planets. With a black energy blade in hand, he advanced directly towards Naruto. The energy blade in his hand aimed for Naruto's head with precision. This position clearly indicated his intention to sever Naruto's head. However, Naruto did not withdraw. He advanced and proactively welcomed Sentry's attack. 
As the energy blade was poised to strike Naruto's head, he had already executed a kick. This kick made direct contact with Sentry's face. It was quite straightforward. With this forceful kick, Sentry was propelled backward once more. The energy blade made contact with Naruto's head however, it did not cause any damage to his hair. The unauthorized version simply could not surpass the authentic version. On this occasion, Sentry was propelled even further away by Naruto. By the time he succeeded in stabilizing himself, his face was unrecognizable. Only blood and white bones were visible. Naruto's kick effectively fractured Sentry's bones. Regardless of the severity of the injury, it was inconsequential, as Sentry possessed the ability to recover rapidly. The physical damage inflicted by Naruto's kick was overshadowed by the profound sense of humiliation experienced. Indeed, Naruto's true intention was to bring about his humiliation through the kick. This outcome was understandably unsatisfactory for Sentry. The animosity within him intensified. Initially, he intended to eliminate the old god with assurance in order to establish himself as the new deity of the world. It is surprising that Naruto was able to defeat him without any resistance. How could Sentry not feel a sense of grievance after all this? This time, rather than waiting for Sentry to launch another attack, Naruto proactively pursued the opportunity to engage. As Sentry was in the process of recuperating from his injuries, Naruto had already obliterated the planet behind him and reached his position. Subsequently, Naruto seized Sentry by the neck and elevated him. Shortly thereafter, he elevated his knees and struck Sentry's back. With a sharp sound, Naruto's knee fractured Sentry's spine. His entire body appeared to be contorted, with the back of his head nearly reaching his heel. This time, even Sentry was unable to suppress a mournful howl. One could readily envision the lethal nature of Naruto's assault. Stay tuned for more. With that, this video comes to a close. I want to thank you for taking the time to see this video. Leave a like, subscribe and watch the following video if you like this one.